thisiscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Hi, everyone. This is your host, Joe Witten. I'm on my own today. Fuad's off preparing for his spice and smoke dinner in Katoomba, which is very exciting. Sadly, I am like 3,000 kilometers away and don't get to eat the yummy food. Bummer. But I'm, I'm wishing them all the best and hoping they have an awesome dinner. Um, Fuad's going to be cooking with his friend, his chef friend, Bektash, and they have the most amazing menu um, worked out. So have fun, guys. I wanted to have a little chat about what we're talking about today, but I won't do a long intro. Um, so I have the lovely Becky Plotner on the podcast today. Um, Becky is a, let me just explain who she is. If you didn't hear her last podcast I did with her, I really recommend you go and listen to that one first if you've got time. Um, and I'll put the link in the show notes. It was an amazing podcast, really outlining um, sort of the bio biological um, premise for gaps and how it all works and what a leaky gut is and how you heal it and just the real basics behind gut health and healing. Um, and then she also went into some detail about things like iodine protocol and things like that in the last podcast. This podcast is a gaps Q and A. So we asked in the gaps groups if people had questions and there were so many that we couldn't get through them all, but we did as, as many as we could. Um, and I also asked Becky if she could just give us some ideas, um, of the most common mistakes with gaps. Um, so she talks about things like how to properly make meat stock and the difference it can make, um, to, to have an easily digested meat stock and to get that into your diet and things like starting really slowly with fermented foods, um, how to get onion and garlic into the diet slowly if you're um, on you know, a FODMAPS kind of diet and you're working into gaps um, and really, really practical things like that. We also talk about um, natural relief for headaches and for period pain, things out like how to deal with adrenal fatigue, constipation, diarrhea. These are um, constipation, diarrhea, and candida are all very common for GAPS patients. And so she talks about how to work through those things, how to help kids who limit their food, and um, just some really good encouragement for mums for not stressing out and, um, you know, thinking about what foods they're getting and the nourishment from those, um, how to support your body through surgery and after surgery, if you're having some kind of surgery or wisdom teeth removed or something like that, um, something with anesthetic, how to support and look after your body for healing and um, important factors to look at besides gaps when you're working on healing. So we, we went through quite quite a range of subjects and I think you'll find it really interesting. So for those of you who don't know Becky, She's a traditional naturopath. Uh, I think they call it a, a naturopathic doctor in America. She's in America. We just did the interview through Skype. Um, she lives in Georgia and she works as a certified GAPS practitioner, sees clients in her office and on Skype. She's been published in Wise Traditions. She's spoken at two Western A Price conferences um, she speaks at Certified GAPS Practitioner Trainings. She's been on many radio shows, television shows, writes for Nourishing Plot. Um, her son had really, you know, bad effects of autism and Asperger's and ADHD, bipolar, um, hypoglycemia, dyslexia, and she worked with him um, for, for years and he just improves so much and her story is fascinating which she does tell her story of her own health journey as well in the first podcast um, she also specializes in leaky gut and parasitology which she studied through Duke University finishing with the distinction and she's a chapter leader for the Western A Price Foundation so she's very knowledgeable and she's just one of the most beautiful people you'll ever meet. Um, she is the mentor for Elise Comerford, who's our GAPS practitioner here in Australia. And um, Becky learns directly under Dr. Natasha. 
So she's, yeah, she's learned a lot and she's got so much to share. So I hope you'll really enjoy this podcast and get a lot out of it. Whether you're doing gaps or not, you'll find just some really practical help for gut healing and natural health and natural medicine. Um, So I hope you all enjoy it. And for those of you in Adelaide, we'll see you soon. Welcome back, Becky. So nice to have you here again. So good to see you, Joe. I'm so happy to be here. We have a lot of um, comments on the chat groups, um, especially in the GAPS groups, saying, I loved Becky's last podcast and can you ask her this, this and this? So we have heaps and heaps of questions for you. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, I don't think I've met an Australian person that I don't like. You guys are just the best. Aww. I'm GAPS is hard. There's a lot of things that happen when you move through GAPS. And it's all about the body speaking to you. Yes. And when the body tells you, hey, hey, I need this, if you don't know what it's saying, it's very confusing. Plus, when you're in the middle of needing gaps, you're ju- it's hard to think and there's so much information. So uh, any question that you have, I'm sure I've had it myself too. So it's very common to feel, ah! So <laughs> Well, if anyone hasn't listened to Becky's first podcast that she did with me, uh, well, it's been a couple of months back now, three or four, um, you really should go and listen to that one because it'll give you a really good base to go from. And some of the questions that we're going to talk about today lead on from that podcast. And also, I think we're going to deal with some trickier questions because, um, you know, Sometimes there's things that people get a bit stuck on with gaps and or with any kind of healing journey. It's, you know, you get to, you plateau sometimes mm-hmm. and um, pushing past those things. And, and Becky, you said you'd be happy to share some of the um, some of the issues that are quite common that people mistakes, sorry, that people make on gaps. So that would be great as well. Maybe if we could just start with a few of them, just like if you could get them in a nutshell. <laughs> Um, a few of the most common mistakes, because that might cover a lot of the questions anyway. Do you want to start with a few of those, or am I putting you on the spot? No, 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 no. That's fantastic. Okay. So honestly, overall, probably the biggest thing that we tweak when somebody comes and has questions is meat stock. Mm-hmm. Um, when I started GAPS, I didn't know what I was doing. The the book is full of so much information. Dr. Natasha. It's very thorough with how she lays stuff out. And it was just too much for me to grasp at the time because I was just sick. And I actually really jumped in full bore, wholeheartedly, (laughs) because I'm the kind of person that, you know, I don't want to dance around it. I'm just going to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I kept getting sicker. And all I could think was, she's having people heal. I'm not. There must be something else that I'm missing. So I really went back with a fine tooth comb and realized I was making bone broth instead of meat stock. Mm -hmm. The difference between the two is what we see quite frequently. Now, bone broth is where we can take um, raw bones, raw bones with meat on them, bones that had been cooked previously and we're cooking them again. And we cook them for a very long time, 12 hours. 24 hours, 48 hours, and it, it's filled with a lot of nutrition, a lot of amino acids, a lot of enzymes, a lot of balanced nutrition. It is a wonderful, wonderful food, but it is a full GAPS food. And for most people, it's an advanced full GAPS food. When we're doing something that is uh, with a person that has an autoimmune disease or allergies or something where there is intestinal permeability, where we have that leaky gut and the food particles that go into your digestive tract are leaking through those holes into the bloodstream and the microbes, the pathogenic overgrowth of microbes in the intestinal tract are also leaking through that, those holes into the bloodstream. It's creating this, as Dr. Natasha calls it, a river of toxicity mm-hmm. that is flooding the bloodstream with too much. Now, the mitochondria come, they eat it up. There's a whole process that happens when that stuff is in the bloodstream, but the body can't heal the intestinal tract, address and, and support 
the intestinal tract when it's dealing with all of this extra stuff in the bloodstream. So meat stock actually seals those holes in the, in the intestinal tract. It cuts those yeasts that are stretching through the intestinal wall. It decapitates them hmm. and seals those holes. Meat stock is loaded with biotin and collagen and glucosamine and coenzyme Q10. It's got a lot of stuff in it that is basically what should be in your intestinal tract. So you're kind of pouring intestinal tract glue <laughs> down into your intestinal tract to seal those holes. And now your body can start working on proper support of the body because it's no longer contaminating itself with that river of toxicity. Now, in terms of meat stock, we could make it a thousand different ways. Each individual, you make your meat stock different than I make my meat stock. And it's going to be individual because of where you live in the country, uh, because of what kind of animals you can source for making the meat stock, what type of foods you tolerate in terms of making the meat stock, what type of symptoms you have in your body. So in the most pristine the deeper damaged person who needs the most strict way of making meat stock, we want to use three different types of bones. And those bones are going to be bones with a little meat of meat on them. And that basically means like meat that's with an inch of the bone and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. The more we get far away from the bones, the more it turns into muscle and muscle is more fibrous and it's more difficult to digest. Now, we can do a huge steak in our meat stock, and that's still stage one gaps. It's just more advanced mm -hmm. stage gaps. So the three types of bones, bones with a little bit of meat on them, marrow bones, and then joint bones. And every single time you make your meat stock, you're going to have a different combination of bones according to what you can source, according to the animal, so when we take those types of bones, we want to put them into the pot like puzzle pieces. And then for the average size chicken, which is like three to four to five pounds, we put in one tablespoon of mineral salt. And mineral salt is any salt that has a variation of color to it. It's mm -hmm. been harvested from the mine or from the ocean waters that have dried up on salt beds. And it hasn't been bleached out. It's just been harvested, dried, and canned or, and shipped to you. That mineral salt is going to pull out some of the nutrition from the bones, from the marrow, from the skin, from the meat. And it's very important to put in in the beginning of the stock. We also want to put in some crushed peppercorns in that stock. The thing about the crushed peppercorns is they're very difficult to, uh, to digest. It's one of the most advanced herbs and spices to digest. And, and, and a, the amount that you put in is according to what you can tolerate. But what we want to do is we want to take those peppercorns and crush them. And we do that by laying them on the counter and putting like a, a, a butcher's knife mm -hmm. on top of them and pushing it down and just, and they're kind of, they'll splew everywhere. If they spit off all over your counter, you're doing it right. And, <laughs> and you want to scoop them up. And I put them in a coffee filter. Do you guys have yep. brown coffee filter? I was saying this to Dr. Natasha one time, and she's like, what are you talking about? What does that mean? She goes, so different parts of the country so. have different things. So yeah. you can put it in a, a brown coffee filter, like a piece of paper that you would brew in your coffee pot to hold your coffee grounds, or like an old T-shirt, anything that you want to tie it up in. It's funny. I just saw the other day, I was searching for um, like calico bags to put your vegetables in in the fridge and you damp them and it keeps your veggies fresh. And nice. um, there's a brand here in Australia that has little calico tea bags, organic calico tea bags. So you can just put your tea or that kind of thing, like um, your herbs for a bouquet gummy, your peppercorns, you just put in there, pull the drawstring, pop it in and then, yeah, it's not all through it. Um, oh, that's Wonderful. Because tea think, bags that aren't organic like that actually have plastic in that's them. That's right. That's right. Arcanum, yeah. I know. Them, which is plastic they put in the tea bags. How awful is that? I know. I mean, it'd be so easy to make them, but yeah, there's a, there's a brand. Uh, now I can't remember the name, of course, but when I find it, I'll stick it in the link on the show notes. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry. Keep going. 
if you put tie up that those peppercorns in a little cachet like that mm-hmm. with a coffee filter or a piece of t-shirt or old cloth, then when it's done cooking, you can just pull that cachet out and throw it away. Mm-hmm. You don't have to strain the stock. It's totally up to what your preference is. The peppercorns are very important. Number one, because of flavor, but mostly because the peppercorns are actually going to cause your digestive tract to secrete digestive juices, which are part of the body supporting itself properly so it can work towards the end goal. There are things I can't say legally, so I'm trying to say <laughs> Being careful how you say things. <laughs> yep. I didn't know that, the importance oh, of adding yeah. the pepper. I mean, I add it because it's delicious, but I didn't know that it was important for you. Yeah, it is. It helps the body to secrete different digestive juices, Juicy. and the more we get it working, the more it's working. So that's why we do that. And there's other reasons too, but that's pretty much the primary ones. Mm -hmm. And then what you want to do, you can actually put bay leaves in there or sprigs of thyme or sprigs of rosemary, but those are also just for flavor and they get removed before we consume them. They would be introduced to eat at stage three. Mm -hmm. Of course, bay leaves, you don't end up eating them because they're not really eatable. (laughs) (laughs) So what you want to do then is you want to fill it up with filtered water and in somebody who has deeper damage, somebody with autoimmune diseases, somebody with Lyme, somebody with allergies that are really controlling their lives, we really want to make sure that we just cover those bones, like no more than a finger width of water. Mm -hmm. If somebody's damage is not so great. We can put about an inch of water on top of that. Somebody that has even lighter damage, we can put two inches of water on top of that. And somebody who has even lighter damage can do like three inches of water on top of that. One of the things that's going to be in the new book that we have coming out, and it's probably going to be another six months before he actually drops, Mm -hmm. is going to be a bunch of questions that I had with Dr. Natasha, where she, I asked her very, very specifically And she said, you don't ever want more water than what the actual meat and chicken and bones or whatever animal you're using. No more water than what that is displacing. Right. I know it's real common. Like, I want to get the most out of this stuff. I don't want to make this again. Yeah. I want to, I want to just have to make it once for the week and I'm just going to fill the pot up really, really high with water. Basically, if you're doing that, I know you're trying to stretch your dollars but it's actually diluting the glue. Right. And it's not going to really seal as well as we need it to seal. And I, I get the whole we're on a tight budget thing. The cool thing is the cheaper cuts are the ones that are the most beneficial. Mm. So if you have a, a chicken processing a farm near you that is trustworthy, like wing tips are like yeah. nothing. You can go yeah. and get like a pound bag of wing tips for like a dollar or two. Um, chicken necks, mm-hmm. chicken backs chicken heads if yep. I don't have big girl panties big enough to put chicken heads in my Hey, I've got, I've got chicken heads and chicken feet in my freezer. Oh my God. <laughs> chicken <you're> hearts. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got those chicken hearts like you told me. Yeah, yeah. My we have a, wait, sorry. The head. <laughs> Go ahead. So basically the cheaper cuts will bulk up your pot and fill your pot up higher with the amount of, of chicken pieces in there. So the more you stick in there, the, the cheaper it's going to be. And that's how we can extend our stock with it being less expensive. And if you do it that way, if you don't just cook one chicken, but you cook one chicken, one bag of feet, one bag of necks, one bag of wingtips, and you just keep building up your pot in terms of the amount that you're putting in there, the cooking process is still exactly the same. We still just want to put in one tablespoon of mineral salt and the peppercorns per size of the average chicken. So just keep adding that amount as you build it up. Now, when you have more water in the pot and more pieces in the pot, it will take longer to come to a boil, but all of the rest of the timing is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And that way you could only, like when I was really in, I did stage two for a year because I was so, so sick Mm -hmm. and I just needed to have that extra healing with that extended period of time on that most healing stage. So I would get down into a rhythm where I would go to the farmer on Saturday morning. I would bring back all of the bones that he had and I would just lay them on my countertop to thaw. Then I would stick them in my pot 
to soak overnight because he was beef bones. If it were chicken mm-hmm. bones, I would only let it soak in the water for like 20 minutes. But for his bones, I would let it soak for four hours or whatever I had. And then I would turn the pot on high the next morning, bring it to a boil. And after it, when it first starts to come to a boil, there'll be a foam on top of that. That's the bones cleaning themselves. Now, some people will say that's the protein coming off of the meat. Well, I don't really understand that because if that were the protein coming off of the meat, it would be all of the amount of meat that was coming to the top of the pot. Plus, we've seen farms where they do very, very strict methods of raising their animals or their chickens, and we get hardly any foam on the yeah, top of Yeah, that's true. Uh, and we use farms that are not as strict and they're more big manufacturing oriented and we get a lot of foam mm. on. So I, I still think that it's the bones cleaning themselves. Um, so we want to scoop that scoobage off the top of the pot. With <laughs> scoobage. A, That's a good word. It's an official word right there. <laughs> we'll add it to the dictionary. <laughs> yeah, right? If it's not official, it should be. <laughs> it should be. Scoobage. <laughs> scoop that off with a holy spoon and put it in a little bowl. And then by the time we keep scooping it off and we've got all of that foam, it's, it's at a full rolling boil. We want to throw away what we've just scooped off. But once it's at that full rolling boil, we want to turn it down to a low simmer and then put a lid on top of it and cook it for the size of the bones. If it is a very small fish, a half hour. If it is a larger fish, an hour. If it is chicken, two hours. If it is pork or beef or moose, bigger bones, we don't get moose. (laughs) Some folks do in the United States, and they're huge. I mean, wow. You have to hang them in like a three story warehouse to process them. I mean, it's huge. We we eat a lot of lamb, though. So that would be about the same as the beef. Yeah, it's kind of a little smaller. A little bit less, yeah. Smaller than beef, so and it's bigger than chicken, so I would go for two and a half hours. Okay. Now, um, some people will cook it a little bit longer than that. Other people who have a really high sensitivity with a histamine issue cook it for a little bit less. Mm-hmm. So now that's how we actually make the meat stock. We want to uh, once that's done cooking for the time frame, we pull the chicken out of the pot, stick it on a plate take the skin off of the chicken and put it back in the pot. If you can remove any of the joints, take those off and put them back in the pot. When I say, if you can remove any of the joints, I mean the joint tissue kind of disintegrates in your hands. Mm -hmm. If it's, if it's firm and crunchy, it's going to remain firm and crunchy and we want very easy to digest. So we want it to be soft. Yeah. So we take all those bits, put them back into the pot. And then blend it in with an immersion blender, or you can stick it in a food processor and then pour it into the pot, put a little bit of the stock in there with it so it's easier to blend up, put it in your blender, whatever you've got, and then put it back in your pot. And that'll make it really rich and full of of flavor and nutrition. But it's very specific. Like I said, the amount of water that you put in, how you cook it. So if somebody has a gallbladder that's really struggling, eating fat makes them nauseous or they actually do vomit. So that person would not put that skin back in Mm. if it caused them a problem. They instead would stick it in their jars or in their um, bowl and put it in the refrigerator. If you're doing that, you don't want to stick it in the refrigerator when you just took it off the stove. You want to let it cool for a little bit because if you put that really hot food in the refrigerator, it's going to cool down the temperature of the refrigerator inside. And that's going to cause the other food in your refrigerator to go rancid. So let it cool the counter a little bit. And what we want to do with somebody that has that nausea, the struggling gallbladder, is we want to put it in the, the refrigerator. And as it cools, the fat that is in that stock, even though you didn't blend fat back into it, the fat that's in the stock is going to rise to the top and create a clear fat layer on top of that stock. You can just remove that and put it in a Ziploc baggie in your freezer until later when you can tolerate it. So now you have a very low fat stock 
that is tolerable to somebody that has a struggling gallbladder. Mm -hmm. And as we support that gallbladder with proper herbs and, and coffee enemas to help pull out gallstones and all the other kind of stuff, once we kind of flush the gallbladder a little bit, we're able to then tolerate that fat and we can add it in slowly back into our system. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody who has a lot of joint problems, somebody who has knee pain or or rheumatoid arthritis or arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, somebody who has a joint issue, God makes it very, very easy in terms of what do I do? We eat the problem. Mm-hmm. So if eat the joints. Problem, <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you have a problem with the joints, eat the joints. So let's throw in more chicken feet mm-hmm. into that stock. So most of the time when, if I could say, what is the number one thing that I see that we can tighten up for folks to get more out of the time they're putting into it. It's the meat stock. Let's okay. tighten up how we're doing the meat stock. So now that's laid out, like we said before, on Nourishing Plot. If you want to get pictures and step by step, just go to Nourishing Plot Chicken Stock or Nourishing Plot Meat Stock or Nourishing Plot Fish Stock. And I lay it out step by step. That's good. Thank you. For a child, we want to do a minimum of three cups a day. For an adult, we want to do a minimum of five cups a day. If we have a very, very severe situation, feel free to do one cup every hour. Yep. Okay. That's good. So would they, what would you say um, is, have you got some more tips for us on some things that people really struggle with? Well, that's usually the top thing. That's the top one? Yeah. In addition to that, the next thing that we really see is constipation. Yes, I was actually going to ask you about that. Can I just actually read you this question? Because if we're we're going to talk about constipation, I'll just go straight into this question. Um, So this is from a lovely lady in our group who's been doing GAPS for a fair while. Um, She's been on GAPS for two and a half years and pretty much gluten-free for three and a half years. Um, And she's really struggling now and has sort of gone backwards and gone back onto the breads and things because she feels like it's no use, nothing's working. Um, But she said that she's never been able to improve the chronic constipation. And she's tried so many things, taken so many supplements, done everything she's been advised to do. um, And she feels like, she did gaps properly, but feels like it didn't help with the constipation and she hasn't been able to afford to get help from a practitioner. So, yeah. you know, there may yeah. have been some things that she could tweak there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And this is another one of those things where the body is speaking to you. So fortunately for her, I had the exact same situation. Ah. I did not know that you were supposed to move your bowels every day. Oh, wow. I thought it was normal to to have a bowel movement once every 10 days or once every 15 days. Mm. That's how I lived my whole entire life until I was, I'm not kidding, maybe 42 years old. That's how I lived my whole life. And I did not know there was any other way. When, when you jump on gaps, there's a lot of different things that happen inside. Mm -hmm. And one of those things that happens inside is sometimes we get a lot of parasitic activity because they're eating up chemicals, they're eating up pesticides, they're eating up metals. Well, they have a rotation cycle in our body. One of the things that they do is they pass through the liver and bits and pieces of them break off and the body wraps bile around them to protect you from those bits and pieces Mm -hmm. or other things that are in there. And, And that forms gallstone. And then those gallstones, like if you took the liver and sliced it in half, it would look like a tree that had all the dendritic branching that goes out into the depths of the liver. And it would have all these little apples Mm -hmm. on the tree are the gallstones. And it would make them in the liver, stores them in the gallbladder like a little suitcase. But when we keep having too many of them, now the gallbladder gets full and it can't spit the bile out of the bile ducts. And the bile kind of acts like lube. And it kind of escorts the stool out really nicely. And that's really a common thing that we see on GAPS is we're really not getting the bile flow that we need to move the stool out. Another really common thing that we see, especially in folks that are autistic 
or um, OCD is we see a lot of um, overgrowth of different microbes like Clostridia. Clostridia looks like a pile of vitamin capsules with a cluster of hair laying on top of it. And it exhales a gas that is paralytic. So it paralyzes peristalsis. And you can't poop if you wanted to because mm. you just are paralyzed. When we have a lot of these pathogenic microbes in the intestinal tract, a lot of other things happen where it, it paralyzes the migrating motor complex. We can't move things to small intestines. There's a lot of things that will cause uh, motility to slow down or stop. There are many people in GAPS that have this situation. Very, very common. So if it is a gallbladder issue, we support the gallbladder. If it is a clostridia issue, we support the pathogenic overload. But the bottom line is, is we have to get the stool out because that's the garbage. Mm. If take the garbage out every day, we are reabsorbing that garbage into our system and retoxifying ourselves. We're recycling our own toxins and kind of spinning our wheels and spending a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of time and getting mentally exhausted doing it. So the best way to help get it out is with uh, enemas. Mm -hmm. Cleaning enemas, coffee enemas to help clear the gallstones out of the gallbladder. Um, but there's a lot of other things too. Uh, Dr. Natasha discusses high doses of vitamin C, and you can do that with acerola cherry powder. You can do it with camu camu. Mm -hmm. You can do it with exorbic acid. You can do it with liposomal vitamin C. You can do it with magnesium oxide. And magnesium oxide is not a form of magnesium that's going to saturate your cells with depleted magnesium, but instead it's going to help you to just move your bowels. It'll give you the loose stools. So I've actually asked Dr. Natasha, how much magnesium oxide do you use? Because I've got a lot of uh, young boys with autism who just don't move their bowels. Mm. And the more the fecal matter is in there, the more they, they turn into the human tornado and yeah. everything in that. It's just ballistic mm -hmm. and it's horrible for the child. It's horrible for the family members. So I asked her how much magnesium oxide do we use? And she said up to three tablespoons a day, wow. which is a lot. Mm -hmm. So what we find is usually somewhere around a teaspoon, maybe two. But if you need to take three tablespoons a day, that's what she says is totally fine. Sometimes we see that we go from constipation, constipation, constipation. We increase it the tiniest little bit, and it's like an explosive rocket ship <laughs> coming up the other end. So it's kind of a fine line sometimes. Some people use magnesium citrate, like natural calm, before they go to bed. But some people say they're in a rhythm where they take one teaspoon of magnesium citrate before they go to bed. They wake up in the morning and doop, 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 they go to the bathroom. Magnesium oxide is not such an immediate response after you take it like vitamin C or magnesium citrate would be. Sometimes it doesn't hit you until the next day, middle of the day. Mm -hmm. um, you can also take lots more animal fats, which help yeah. to lubricate and slip things out, which of course you can't do if you have a struggling gallbladder because it again will make you nauseous or make you vomit. You can also do um, lots more of the kraut juice or fermented brines of the probiotics but that's only if you tolerate that much without a whole lot of die off. So for me, I had to do enemas every single day for gosh, maybe a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, uh, at that time there wasn't the whole circulating on social media. Oh, if you do too many enemas, you're going to get relying on them and you won't be able to move your bowels on yourself because you're teaching your body that, your body may, is made to move its bowels. God didn't make a mistake with your <laughs> bowel tract. We have to get the stuff out and it will just start moving. So like I said, I went for 42 years, co chronically constipated. I'm 47 now and it still surprises me when I go to the bathroom and I just yeah. go to the bathroom. Because yeah. I'm so used to it not being that way. Mm. And, and once it starts going, I mean, it'll... Between the enemas, like even if you're doing enemas in the morning and then enemas before you go to bed, one day you'll just move your bowels on your own in the middle of the day. Mm. That's 
the sign of, oh, I'm probably getting there. I may be able to back off to once a day enemas or once every other day enemas yeah. and just kind of go less and less from there. But we've got to get the stuff out and that will help to feel better. But I get it. I get it. It is so hard. And sometimes it takes so long. But one day it'll just be that way. I used to be, I, I, my heart is struggles for her because it's just such a, a horrific situation. I used to be celiacs myself. And, um, and, and I never thought that I would eat wheat again and, and, and I can eat anything now at this point in time. And I still move my bowels. The problem with that is there's been so much healing that has happened that I can eat anything. <laughs> and the good thing with that is there's been so much healing that's happened that I can eat anything. Yay! So, <laughs> you just stay steady. I mean, if you're going to be constipated, let's put our system in with good stuff and get the garbage out. Because the constipation is going to be there whether you're on gaps or not. Mm -hmm. Other people need more fiber. So starting with full gaps is a really great place to start if that's tolerated and do more fiber from the vegetables because that helps to keep the bowels moving. Right. What about if people have, like, um, for instance, this lady does have the MTHFR gene mutation and it's partly um, the difficulty of detoxing? Mm hmm that's a very good question. Uh, you have to remember that the MTHFR genetic mutation, this is epigenetics. Yes. When we have decline in our intestinal tract, we will turn genes on. When we repair that intestinal tract, we turn those genes off. So this is not, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Or, oh, yeah. but a specific situation. It's just a symptom of the depth of damage. When we talked in the other podcast, and folks can go back and, and read, listen to that again, but when we talked about that, we talked about the whole shag carpet that makes up your intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. It's like a big piece of velvet, and it's got all those villi sticking straight up like finger-like protrusions. In that velvet layer, there are little balls. Some of those balls are going to help us to move our bowels. Some are not. But there's a two inch layer of mucus on top of that that makes stuff for our body. One of the things it makes for our body is B9, which is folate. And this with those balls, this is the genetic mutation, the MTHFR genetic mutation. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't even think it's worth spending the money to determine, do I have it? Do I not have it? I've never seen a GAPS person who does not mm -hmm. have the MTHFR our genetic mutation or some of them in any way, shape or form in their variances. So it's just kind of what happens when we have the decline in the ecosystem. It's just telling us we need to focus on getting the stool out so that we can get the garbage out so that we're less toxic so that the body can breathe freer and use the mm. food without poison and just reduce the toxic load. Yeah. Okay. So that's basically... I'm sure that it would be great to see a practitioner to get more detailed answers for each person, um, but that's a good good first steps. <laughs> Poor thing, it's very hard. Yeah, it is it's very hard. Impressive. I can I can tell you this though. In my in my gaps journey, really good healing has always happened because see, I didn't have a choice. Mm. I could not go back and and go back to the bread. Yeah. I couldn't. Because I would be laid out in bed for a horrific pain. Right. My stomach would blow up. I couldn't even have my T-shirt laying on my stomach because it hurts really? so bad. Really? Wow. Yeah. And, um, and, and are, you, was, are you celiac or no? Now? No. No. Okay. Because that's interesting. Um, one lady was saying she went backwards because she wanted to get the celiac test done. And so for 12 weeks or whatever, she ate gluten. And yeah. then when she got the test done, she wasn't celiac. But she's so sick now. It's just like, don't even go there. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Tom O'Brien, who's kind of the gluten yes. guy. Yeah, we he interviewed him. Yeah. Talked, oh, yeah, he's wonderful. He is. He actually talks about how a lot of times you're doing more damage that way because of eating that gluten during that time frame. Mm. And a lot of the tests don't tell you, uh, yes, you're celiac. He said there's the celiac who test celiac. And then there's the non-diagnosed celiac who wow. are still celiac. Wow. So really, I don't really get too hung up on, this tests. is what I have, yeah. this is my label, these mm -hmm. are the tests. I get hung up on, 
how does your body feel when you eat that food? Exactly, yeah. Your body. Common sense, isn't it? Yeah, but it's hard when you're in the middle of it and it's hard to it think. It is because you, you kind of want to, um, a label so that you can do what they say to do for that thing. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. and sometimes yeah. you need a label for your husband or yeah. for your mother-in-law. Or, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Mm. Um, can you give us some ideas of things that you found helpful when you were working on healing because you were so sick that are – besides the gap stuff so in addition to the food for medicine um so what yeah. did you find really helpful there's been a few questions but we've been talking a lot about that lately yeah um that's a really really good question so mm. uh, and i can tell you because i've just gone through another huge um hard section of my life i went back mm. I, I told you before we talked we yeah. I just got back to vegas from the testing from the American naturopathic medical certification board. So it was a big, huge test, a lot of stress. So whenever I'm stressed, even now, after so much healing, uh, my body feels it. I mean, I oh, mine too. Feel it. so it's seriously outside of that. from it. Yeah. And mm. it totally, down. It does. we are in a time frame where as women and men too, we just do and do and do and do and do and, to answer your question bluntly, what is the number one thing outside of gaps? Becky Plotner, chill out. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It is okay to sit down with a hot cup of tea and listen to the birds. Yeah. It is good to do that. Yeah. It is okay to lay down for a second and take a load off mm. or 20 minutes mm. or an hour and a half. Yeah. It is good to rest and just calm down call somebody on the phone you haven't talked to in a while mm. just reconnect and do the things that fill you up that give you that wave of oh, inside just mm. that is really powerful it is yeah I know when I get very stressed um, I want to rest and get out in nature and I want to talk to someone who I really love and trust and can you know, you can get that connection and uh, I guess a bit of a, you know, just sharing sharing whatever it is you're worrying about or whatever. And even if they can't do anything about it, to have, to have someone to talk to makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got something. Everybody has something going yeah. on in their life. There is yeah. not one single person out there who's got everything going really well. No. And unless you really say, I got this going on, a lot of times people can't really tell you what they've got going on. So right. when you really open yourself up and make yourself vulnerable or you ask mm -hmm. somebody, I need prayer for this. It, mm -hmm. it really does make relationships deeper and tighter. It does. It's hard. There are a lot of people out there that are, oh, that's not the right way to do it. Or, oh, that's not what you should be doing. And, and when we're in a sick state like this, that's really not what we need. We mm -hmm. need and love and encouragement and we can give that to other people and just being able to open up to somebody like that and just go into nature and just it's very filling it is it really is okay so some more questions <laughs> fire away okay is it normal for a two-year-old to have a lot of undigested food in poo he eats quite fast and doesn't chew very well also chokes on his food and while drinking water doesn't have a tongue tie. He does have a white tongue, however, and he constantly wants food. He's tall and slender and a little underweight. I have leaky gut, though, and gut microbiome imbalance. I imagine he's inherited some of this. So this is the someone answer, quite new yeah. to gaps. Yes? <laughs> okay. Yes, the answer is yes, wholeheartedly, but we can change any number, not just 2-year-old, 47-year-old, 16-year-old, 59 year old, <laughs> any person, is it normal to have undigested food in the stool to gulp down your food? Yeah, we all have to really slow down mm -hmm. and really sit at the table and talk between our bites mm -hmm. and earn proper table manners and just chill out. Um, yeah. It's the so chilling out thing again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Natasha says it's totally normal and fine to have undigested food food in your stool. It is not a marker that I can't move off this stage. It is a marker that you're not done healing yet. Mm, okay. And there are some foods that will never come out digested. Uh, you know, 
nuts, pumpkin seeds, seeds. Uh, you will often see those coming out at all times. We homeschool, and one of my favorite field trips of all time was when we went to the water treatment facility. Oh, really? <laughs> My littlest was, I think he was eight or seven at the time, and we're walking through all these tanks, and we were making jokes. All of us mom were like, this is the crappiest tour I've ever been on. <laughs> and so we're cracking all the jokes, and all of a sudden, my little Gaps guy goes, Mom, look, there's corn. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> there are some things that are never going to digest, even when it comes to the water treatment system. Plan. Oh, gosh. So, so, yeah, no, I wouldn't worry about it. It's totally normal. Okay. You can add more probiotic foods like crowd or something like that into the actual meal mm -hmm. that the person is eating if they're tolerating it without die off and that will actually help as a digestive aid but I wouldn't get hung up over that one at all um some ideas for people who are having surgery or um like wisdom teeth out things like that if they're suffering from chronic fatigue and maybe adrenal fatigue and they've got all the gut issues, and then they go into surgery, sometimes that can take a long time to get over, can't it? Um, yeah. Is there some ways to care for the body leading up to surgery and post-surgery? Yeah, absolutely. Rest would be probably the number one thing and just kind of... As I found out. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to do because you're stressed because yeah. you're having surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but And then also, you know, rely on people. Rely on your friends or your relatives or you know, ask for the meals, ask for the help, ask for and give them, you know, there's a lot of great places out there. Give them your website that has all of your meal plans on there and say, go to Joe's this site here. And you've got the meals that you can prepare for me. She's got them together in, in recipes. Mm. It's, it's so easy to just send people, send them to nourishing plot, send them wherever mm. and get the recipes. So they know, cause they want to help you. Yeah. And let them come clean your house. And, and that pulls friendships together even it tighter. Does. And and that's the kind of stuff that, that really binds community together. But I in terms agree. of what can I do in addition to that, um, you can help pull out some of the, um, um, the sedatives or um, any of the medicines that they're giving you during surgery. So you can do activated charcoal mm -hmm. or bentonite clay to help absorb and pull out some of the toxicity that you're experiencing during the surgery. Um, act, increasing your vitamin C levels is really important because it can help pull out the free radicals during that time frame. Um, but rest is really, really important and relying on people that can help you is really good. In terms of going to get your wisdom teeth out, I would definitely see if there is a bioidentical or biological or holistic dentist that's yeah. doing that. To make sure that they're getting the 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 root system properly and mm. doing everything that they possibly can to prevent. There's, you know, there. I don't think that God gave us extra teeth on accident. I don't <laughs> think we're supposed to have our wisdom teeth out, but we live in a time frame where our jaws are not growing to the size that they should be to allow yeah. it. I, my oldest. His wisdom teeth were growing in sideways, oh, pushing in to his other teeth. He didn't have a choice. He had to get his wisdom yeah, teeth Yeah, I think my oldest is going to have to have hers out soon. There's, we have to do these things. When mm -hmm. I was on gaps for three years, I had to go and have surgery and, and get my uterus removed for early stage cancer. Mm -hmm. There's just stuff mm -hmm. happens. Um, I asked Dr. Natasha recently about hernias mm -hmm. and I said, we've got a two year old who's got a hernia. Do we have surgery? And she said, absolutely. Go get the surgery done. Have them just sew up those muscles together. And then I was like, all right, I've got a 67 year old with a hernia. Does he go get surgery? Absolutely. Go get it done. Yeah. Uh, all right. I got an 80 year old <laughs> with a hernia. Do they go get surgery? Yes. If it's really bothering them, go get it done. So there, there are times surgery, Surgery and surgeons and medical doctors are there for a reason. You are not failing if you are using them. It is part of life. If somebody makes you feel like you're failing for using them, consider that person and put them in a different box in your mind. And <laughs> <laughs> so afterwards, when you, especially with anesthetics, you know, you can get that brain fog and, and just like my dad recently had surgery and he feels like weeks later he's still got the brain fog. Um, so it's basically all the detoxing things, yeah? Well, it can be a lot of things, you know. I mean, gosh, they could. <laughs> I mean, the, to help with it, sorry, like working through. Yeah, and I would do enemas to help get the extra mm -hmm. garbage out, even if you are moving your bowels yeah. at that 
time I would get this stuff out as much as you possibly can. Yeah, mm. for sure. What about rest? What about people who have chronic headaches? There's a um, lady in our group who's had headaches all her life, and that's what started her gut issues because she just lived on Nurofen and Panadol and everything. And she's been doing gaps for a fair while. And at first, you know, the first year or so, she thought, well, headaches and detox kind of go together. But after another year or so, she's just like, I'm so tired of these headaches. What can I do? Because she just constantly yeah. has them. So honestly, this is a horrible position to be in because mm -hmm. it can be so debilitating and, yeah. and just don't realize what's happening. But there's a lot of reasons that we can have headaches in the first place. Like you said, the toxicity from having medicines for an extended period of time. Usually the top two reasons that we have headaches are number one, dehydration. And number two, something in the bowel, the fecal matter that's stuck there and it's not getting out. So if it is either of those, enemas are perfect because the enema will hydrate you. Your body will keep that water oh, okay. and you won't flush it back out if you are dehydrated. Um, you can also do coconut water. Yeah. Coconut water is more hydrating than water and you can do an enema with coconut water. Mm. Um, there is a family of four that were sailing the Indian Ocean. And a whale bumped their boat and the boat capsized and mom gathered everything that she could. And, and she was a nurse. Some of the things that she could gather was the makings for an enema kit. They had run out of food quickly and they were doing enemas with the seawater and everybody survived and they were out there for a very long time. Wow. That's a very powerful tool. Yeah. You can get uh, headaches from having too much probiotic. So when you're on gaps, let's consider too much probiotic. And honestly, you could have had a headache before gaps because of fecal matter stuck in the bowel, but now you're having headaches because you're on too much probiotic and it's the same feeling of a headache. So mm -hmm. that's another thing to navigate. Um, and, and it could be that there's something going into your body that you're not realizing. Like a supplement has an ingredient in it that you don't know is there because it's industry standard. So it's not listed on the ingredient list. So just removing anything that you can remove seeing is there a difference when I spend the day outside in nature versus when I spend the day in the house? Yeah. You can get, it could be mold, mold or something. It could be EMFs. It can mm. be smart meters. It can be like a whole lot of stuff. It yeah. can be your couch off gassing mm -hmm. or carpet off gassing. And there's a lot of things that can happen inside the house that, so, you know, go on a trip and see, is it better when I go to mom's house or then when I'm in my house and just kind of navigate those things out. If you can't figure it out from those things, I would see if, if, um, acupuncture helps mm -hmm. it yeah. or if pressing on different areas of your body for acupressure mm -hmm. points helps. And if that doesn't work, there's something out called needling now, which has been out in common for about two years now here in the States where acupuncture needles use needles that are about an inch and a half long mm -hmm. needling needles are much, much bigger. They're like three inches long, five inches long. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> football player, they're much longer. And they go deep into the muscle tissue, sometimes to the bone wow. and real and stuff. So I would navigate a lot of those things. And um, if you if you have your thumb and your pointer finger and you make an L, stick your other hand, uh, finger and, and thumb in that meaty part of the L and you can press right in there. There's a acupressure point right in there for headaches that will mm -hmm. help. You can uh, massage your temples that can help for headaches. Mm -hmm. There are two uh, pressure points that are right above the middle of your eyebrows, like between your hairline and your eyebrows, right in the middle of your eyebrows. And you can just take one hand and stick it thumb on one of the points and pointer finger and other fingers on the other point. And that's very relaxing to just touch mm -hmm. those different pressure points. And that's funny because that's what people do sometimes when they're Yeah, stressed. I was thinking that. that they do. Yeah, it's natural. Naturally make itself down. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so those are the things that I would navigate first and see if, if we can okay. click something off as the cause. Yeah. Okay. Um, a quick question. If this, if this is quick on hormones, so if you've got a lot of estrogen backing up in your system because it isn't being methylated and it's causing symptoms like bad PMS, weight gain, endometriosis, endometriosis, sorry, my, my um, tongue's getting tired. How can we address that using GAPS? And what about um, other adrenal hormone issues in general? 
<laughs> so that's a really good question, and there's a lot involved mm, there. I was thinking um, that. <laughs> yeah, um, but it doesn't mean that it's a, a too difficult of a situation. It just means there's a lot of things that we can check off the list. Um, before I start answering that, uh, for the headaches, yes. I would also try chiropractic care. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm. To just kind of shake things out. But in terms of adrenal hormones, first off, the function of the adrenals is phenomenal. It's I mean, what, they're sorry? Like, it's phenomenal. They're the oh, yes. teeny, teeny, tiny little cones sitting on top of your kidneys. They're so teeny tiny, and they run so much. So mm. it's just an amazing thing. I've had stage four adrenal fatigue myself, so it's really something that you need to address. In terms of the aldosterone that is being released by the adrenal glands, and it's it's just another way that the body, according to where you are genetically weakest, is getting turned on. So we need to just address that specifically. The number one thing that helps to support the adrenals the most, especially on a GAPS protocol, is egg yolks. So raw pastured yolks are very high in cholesterol. Adrenals love cholesterol. They're very high in a ton of nutrition. They're very high in, in A and D and zinc and biotin and, 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 and different fats that you need. And this is something that is very instantly feeding to the adrenals. So first and foremost, I would do like an adrenal shake. There's one on Nourishing Plot. Oh, yes. You can different foods. I know you've got recipes on your site for... Oh, I've been meaning uh, to try your adrenal shake. I keep... Forget, forget about it. I must do that. It is a game changer. Mm. Uh, but Russian custard, and you've got that, and, and eggnog, and ice cream, anything with a lot of yolks, a smoothie, is very, very fitting to an adrenal issue. Now, if you've got a lot of damage or, or rebuilding that you're focusing on, you can't just jump in and do a dozen yolks. Mm. You have to build slowly because yolks are very, very healing and they will, um, it's actually illegal for me to say yolks are very, very supportive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's illegal to say that yolks are healthy oh. because they're, because they're higher in fat, they're higher. Oh, in wow. fat. That's not healthy. Oh, so it's dear. illegal saying that let's make sure we understand each other clearly here. <laughs> <laughs> So as somebody with an adrenal issue, yolks are the game changer for me. We can mm -hmm. still, and I haven't had stage four adrenal fatigue for gosh, maybe eight, nine years. But okay. if we still go for a really long bike ride as a family or kayaking, I will just be toast. Like last Mother's Day, we did a, a bike ride from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon with hills. And it was stupid. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you know, I can do it kind of thing. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, laid myself out and I couldn't even speak on the ride home and oh. took a shower and, and my husband brought me an adrenal shake and boom, I'm up and ready to go again. Wow. So it's really, really feeding to the adrenals. It's okay. really phenomenal. And you really don't see that unless you really have an adrenal issue and, and address it that way and can see it happening. But in addition to the other things, the weight gain, the endometriosis, that is actually connected to an iodine deficiency. Ah. Bitch, when you have your endocrine system is your thyroid, your adrenals, your gonads, when your adrenals are struggling and they're getting pulled down, it will pull down your thyroid. Mm -hmm. and, and now we have this trifecta of, holy cow, I'm just a mess all over the place. So that's definitely something to support with iodine, which is absolutely part of the um, GAPS protocol. Mm -hmm. And and somebody asked Dr. Natasha on GAPS facts about Dr. David Brownstein's protocol. We've talked about iodine um, about five times now, Dr. Natasha and I. Mm -hmm. And every time that we've talked about it, she's told me exactly what to do according to Dr. David Brownstein's protocol. She just doesn't know it's Dr. <laughs> David. She knows this is how you do iodine and that's how you do iodine. One thing she did say one time, we were working with a, a small child, and she did say to put five drops of iodine in their enema bag. I'm like, oh, well, I've never heard him say that. So that was the first thing she had hmm. said that he had said. So um, so that's an iodine support thing. Now, in terms of the bad PMS, that's usually a nutritional deficiency that we can support the body properly. And it's often something that we can support the body with in terms of liver because it takes a lot of energy for your body to pass an egg. Yeah. And it just, it pulls a lot of nutrition it takes. So check your iron levels. You can pull down the bottom of your eyelid. And if the 
tissue underneath the bottom of your eyelid on the inside of your skin. If it's very pale, that's that's connected to iron and, and B12. Liver is phenomenal for that. Mm-hmm. Dr. Natasha would say to go ahead and eat liver the size of your hand mm-hmm. every day for like the first week and a half before your PMS and give that a try. Okay. If you can't stand liver, do I take, I can't stand liver. I'm going <laughs> to don't tell my kids or anybody else. <laughs> okay. We won't tell anyone. <laughs> anyway, so I take the liver and I, when it's, uh, when it's still frozen, but, but a little softer, I slice it up so that it looks like the size of a vitamin capsule mm-hmm. and I lay it out on a cookie sheet and then I put it in the freezer and after a couple hours, I'll scoop that up into a Ziploc baggie and I take that as a vitamin yeah. in the morning. I could, some do days I could do that. Yeah, I could do that and that mm-hmm. will keep enough of that level going. So if you can't really eat the liver mm. or if you can't eat it as pate where you add more butter and a little bit of red wine and mm-hmm. something to drown out the flavor, a lot of onions, <laughs> a lot of garlic, <laughs> then go ahead and make it as that. So you yeah. can do it. So honestly, that bag of liquor in my freezer is my morning vitamin and my little dog's treat when she goes potty. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> it's got a couple of good uses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're like two girls in a family, so we got to hang together. <laughs> Love so it. If the, if the liver doesn't address it, then it's some other kind of nutritional deficiency. And I would just kind of navigate that in that angle um, oftentimes women get a lot of cramping, really mm. bad cramping. And, and that's a magnesium. I would support that with magnesium because it's muscle and muscle cramps are magnesium deficiency. Um, and sometimes we see women that have a lot of bleeding, a lot of bleeding. Mm. That's a vitamin C deficiency. That's scurvy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, I would just address what the body is specifically saying that it needs. Well, that's good. Okay, well, we pr- pretty much run out of time. Um, have we got time? Oh, come on, let's do a couple. Okay, of- okay, good. You're the, you- you're calling the shots. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty more here. Did you want to add a couple? Because I know you've got questions on your page as well. Well, let's go ahead and hit yours. Okay. Uh, we can save mine for another time. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll get one. I don't want my okay. people to get mad. Yeah, that's it. I don't want to, you know, we'll be in trouble. <laughs> Okay, I'll ask one. Okay. Michelle asked, is a Berkey water filter GAPS approved? Absolutely. Okay. There, you hit one. <laughs> that was easy. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on long-term intro for food intolerances? Is it more beneficial to start trying to introduce very small amounts of non-tolerated foods earlier, e.g. FODMAPs foods, or does tolerance take a long time to establish? For context, I'm stage two to three after 13 months on GAPS and I'm still low FODMAP. That's a really good question. So really the FODMAPs that we take out on GAPS are garlic and onion Mm -hmm. because everything else is not part of the GAPS protocol. Mm -hmm. Garlic and onion are incredibly powerful foods. They are sulfur foods. When you eat sulfur foods, the sulfur foods caught, and Stephanie Seneff is the one who really understood this phenomenally. It causes your body to release cholesterol, which does the repair in the system. So they're very, very, very powerful in terms of how they cause your body. Garlic is actually classified as an antibiotic, goes all the way back to World War II in Russia where they had so many soldiers that were injured, they ran out of antibiotics. So they just used a whole lot of garlic as an antibiotic and it's still classified as an antibiotic since then. It doesn't kill the good, it just kills the bad. These are very powerful foods that should not be taken lightly. In addition to that, they will kill the pathogenic overload and parasites. So if you eat too much of it, whatever that is you can tolerate, it'll give you gas Mm -hmm. because it's causing those parasites and different pathogens to die. So it should be handled very um, firmly. This is a real deal. So what we want to do is if we're not tolerating the garlic and onion, we want to go very, very, very slowly. So what that means is we first start with fermenting the garlic and the onion and can do them individually. Usually onion is easier tolerated than the garlic, or you can do them together. And then after it's fermented, take one drop of the brine and try that one drop. And if that's too much, like because of die off, put one drop of the brine in a tablespoon of water, stir that up and take one drop of that. Mm -hmm. Or if that's too much, put it in two or three tablespoons of water, 
stir it up and take one drop of that or put it in a gallon of water, a liter of water, stir it up. Wherever you start, start. And some people, I've never had anybody have to put it in more than a gallon of water and then take it that way and then build with how frequently we're doing it. Once you're doing about, you know, six, seven drops of the actual brine that's fermented, then we can start and go ahead and add the garlic and the onion to our soup. And usually the way we start with that is we take a piece the size of an eyelash, really small, and cook that in your whole pot of stock. Wow. And start building up with the amount that you do from there. Now, if you have such a small amount of tolerance for the fermented garlic and onion brine, you may want to go ahead and start doing some of the MSM that Dr. Natasha talks about in the book and in GAPS Facts, because that helps to be build that deficiency. While you're building that, the more animal fats that you take in, the faster you will be able to tolerate the garlic and the onion. It's just a matter of building forward. Oh, Do you need to stay on stage two or stage one or stage three the whole time that you're doing that? It really depends on the person. Maybe not. Maybe you can move forward to full gaps while you're introducing that stuff slowly. If you're generally asking that question, do I really need to stay here? I really want to have some other food. That's probably because it's time for you to move on. Yeah. So go ahead and move yourself to full gaps while you're still introducing, introducing that garlic and onion slowly. Okay, that's good tips. Good. Um, Kate asks, kids on intro... Um, not eating all the vegetables. What is this a sign of? My five and a half year old is on stage three and will only eat carrots. No reaction to other vegetables, just hates the taste and texture. He also has a parasite that's causing severe stomach pain. Mm. Poor, thing. Poor guy. Mm. Um, so honestly, I really don't care about pushing vegetables mm -hmm. because yolks are more nutritious than vegetables. Mm -hmm. Organ meat is more nutritious than vegetables. Marrow bones are more nutritious than vegetables. Animal fats are more nutritious than vegetables. Meat close to the bone is more nutritious than vegetables. Our body is really wise. And, and God made us so perfect that we will want what our bodies need. Mm -hmm. Carrots are incredibly supportive to a body. When, when we are GAPS person, especially one of the detox channels that breaks down the more damage we have is um, when you eat any food food that is a carotenoid food, a food that is orange, that is filled with beta carotene, like carrots or butternut squash or pumpkin, that beta carotene goes in your mouth down and it gets to your liver and your liver converts the beta carotene to vitamin A. Mm -hmm. All disease is a vitamin A deficiency. So the more carrots you eat, the more you're making that conversion, the more you're supporting your body mm -hmm. to, to recover properly. When you have a broken dox down detox channel, you're not making that conversion. Now that beta carotene is floating around in your body because it didn't get converted to vitamin A and you turn orange. You yeah. get this orange is coming out of your skin. You're the human lupa. Dr. Natasha <laughs> says, keep eating the carrots hmm. because your body needs to open that detox channel. And that's how you open the detox channel. So honestly, I would have out the carrots. Yeah. I, I don't not concern whatsoever. Yeah, not stress. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, shall we go for another one? Yeah. Got yeah. a candida question. Um, how do you do gaps with candida? You're not allowed honey. And what do you do when the kids stop eating what they would once eat and definitely won't try new stuff? So I guess this is kids with candida. That is tricky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is tricky. But honestly, everybody who's a gaps person has candida. Yeah, true. As a matter of fact, here's how you tell if you have candida. Take your two fingers, like you're making a peace sign, mm -hmm. and then hold them right up to your jugular vein and see if you feel something. <laughs> oh. Everybody has candida. Okay. The body is supposed to have candida. When you die, candida albicans is what decomposes your body. Hmm. You have 250 strains of yeast in your body. One of those strains is candida albicans. There's 187 strains of candida albicans in your body. You're supposed to have candida. Now, when your body starts to decline, candida will grow. Candida albicans is actually that yeast that stretches through the intestinal wall that causes the intestinal permeability or oh, leaky yes. gut. That's why you're a GAPS person. 
Mm-hmm. Everybody on GAPS has an overgrowth of candida. Everybody who has any kind of sickness has a higher level of candida albicans. <laughs> Just because you go and you get a test and it doesn't come back with a high level of candida albicans on the test does not mean you don't have a high level of it. It just means you did not test for the three or four strains they tested for, but it just goes hand in hand. When you have heavy metals, candida albicans wraps around those heavy metals to protect you from the heavy metals. If you have a parasite, candida albicans is on that parasite's skin and sometimes in that parasite's body as part of their living ecosystem. If you have female parts, you have more candida. If you have ever had sugar in your life, you have a little more <laughs> It's just part of it. So I would just start on the protocol as Dr. Natasha wrote it so well. I would stay away from honey in the very beginning and build the beneficial strains of yeast that are missing, which cause the pathogenic yeast to really bloom out of control. So I would have a lot of milk kefir. I would have a lot of uh, kombucha, a lot of, of kraut juice and other probiotic foods. Start where you can. And a lot of times people will say, oh, I can't do dairy. I can't do dairy. So I can't do the milk kefir. Remember, GAPS milk kefir is not classified as dairy. It's not the same dairy. Hmm. You can use goat milk that's fermented into dairy or, or sheep milk that's fermented into kefir. And it has digested out all that lactose. Yeah. It has been digested in the fermentation process. The number one problem that people have with dairy is the casein. The casein is converted to paracasein, which is a single molecule, easier to digest. Yeah. So it's really very, very healing. If you're having a problem with the milk kefir, back up the dairy introductory schedule mm-hmm. that Dr. Natasha lays out in the book and get yourself to it. So absolutely very, very, very common. And, um, and, and you'll get there. Well, that's good. Um, one more question on bowel movements. Um, What if you're the opposite direction, so you struggle with the loose stools all the time and even if you've been doing gaps for years? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pathogens that will cause loose stools, like C. diff causes a lot of loose stools. Um, But honestly, the best thing that we see for loose stools is yogurt, gaps fermented yogurt. Up to two cups a day. I've never seen pain uh, still have diarrhea when they're doing two cups of gaps yogurt a day. Okay. Good tip. Awesome. Well, did you want to answer any more? Have you got any more you want to? Sure. I have, I have a bunch. I'll go ahead and I'll ask, I'll answer one more of them. Okay. Okay, So uh, Priscilla asks, I accidentally froze my kefir grains. Ah, Are they dead? Can I revive them? This is a really great question. Just like there are many different ways people will cook in the kitchen. There are many different ways people will treat their kefir grains. Uh, Some people do freeze their kefir grains on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Other people don't. I know a lot of people that lost their kefir grains by freezing them. Um, I actually was tested and and scared by my doctor when he told me that I'm allergic to casein, I'm allergic to lactose on the blood test. So I stopped eating kefir for about eight months because that's what he recommended. And I just put my kefir grains in the refrigerator and put some milk over top of them and let them sit there for eight months. Hmm. Pulled them out afterwards, just fed them a couple times. They came right back to life. Anytime you have a uh, active culture like that, a SCOBY or a grain like that, you've got to feed it to wake it up and bring it back to life. So just kind of brew it a couple times, get it back to life. No, you probably didn't ruin them. Yes, I would just brew them over and over and over, maybe six, seven, eight times. I would be shocked if they didn't come back to life, but Mm -hmm. it does happen. If it does happen, kefir grains are kind of the thing that's very valuable. It's valuable in our house. Mm -hmm. And I give kefir grains to a lot of people for multiple reasons. Number one, I don't want to be the only person flying my freak flag. Number two, (laughs) if if I ever damage my grains or something happens, I want to know that you've got some that I can get. Yeah, we can share. (laughs) Yeah. So, so my, my son, when he was 15, he just drank the bottle of brewing kefir. Oh, that's like, hilarious. Like, where's the that bottle of kefir? Yeah. He's like, for a teenage boy, too. I reckon. Where's the bottle of brewing kefir? I want to just drain the kefir. He goes, oh, I drank it. I'm like, you drank all the grains? And he goes, oh, they had grains in them? Oh, like, that's hilarious. I said, mom, you told me before it was okay if they were kind of lumpy sometimes. I just drank this. I'm like, well... 
who did I give Kiefer Green to that I can get stuff back from now? It's so funny. you need to have a backup. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, that, that's great. There's been so much information in this podcast and I know that we will get you back again because you're so helpful. Thank you so much, Becky. I would love it. Um, Becky, do you, do you want to mention what you're working on in case anyone doesn't know about the probiotic book and then we'll, when you get it ready, we'll get you back on to talk about it. Yeah, we were actually supposed to talk about today our new website that's coming out. And, uh, and on the new website, GAPS Protocol Help is going to be um, the, new, the new book that's the commercial probiotics versus food-based probiotics. And I, I went through all of the studies on PubMed and, and NIH and just kind of like really searching them because I'm cheap, Joe. I, I don't <laughs> want to spend $75 a no. month. So I was like, they've got to be good for me because God made them this way. I got to, nobody <laughs> did this back 300 years ago. So. That's right. We weren't taking supplements back then. Yeah. So I was just like searching and searching and searching. And I got a ton of really good information on there. And that's going to lay out, what do I take if I have MRSA? What do I take if I have C. diff? What do I take if I have an extra lot of glyphosate in my system? Mm, when it, it'll give you the layout of all that stuff. We were supposed to talk about that today, but there's so much information on the site that it kept failing. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's being worked on. So next time we talk, we will hopefully get it together. I'm looking forward to checking out all that information. It's going to be we have a GAPS Protocol Help Facebook page already together. Oh, so good. if anybody wants to, you know, get in place so that it can be hand in hand and conversation wise, go together. Um, but you've got a good setup with your network and your Facebook pages. Oh, you've got so the more the merrier. So make sure you give us the link and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Becky. We really appreciate you taking your time. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.